We've actually inveigled the antipodes to come out to Guildford, Sorry. into Guildford, should I say. Band of the big city, no more London, they're coming to Guildford next Tuesday. So if anybody would like to come over to the Bar des Arts, and I've forgotten the flyers, um, but the Bar des Arts in Guildford is opposite the Yvonne Arno Theatre, and we're going to have the anti-poet, we're really looking forward to it. Now Guildford is a very, um, it's a very respectable city, but um, we do have a few <coughs> people whose marriage problems get a little bit out of hand, and I have to admit that I've had to resort to avoiding divorce, by some quite extreme means, so I'm going to tell you about that. I've been a true and faithful wife to every husband that I've had. <laughs> I promised to devote my life through thick and thin, through good and bad, but only while this rule applies. What I decide shall be, shall be, and there a problem lies. When Johnny led me up the aisle and with a manly, loving smile agreed that he would have and hold me, I loved him, but they never told me I'd have to iron eight shirts a week. What? And when I, <laughs> and when I ventured, could we speak about this imposition on my valuable time? Dear John insisted that this was what he'd meant when opting for the sacrament. <laughs> As a blunt instrument, the iron was great. <laughs> John's status quickly changed to late. My second love was Handsome Dave. Before we married, he would rave about the cute and charming way I spent our weekends. How I lay in bed, expecting cups of tea and tasty <coughs> meals to come to me. One week past our honeymoon, I found that Dave had changed his tune. Get up, he said, and get me bacon, eggs and toast. Come on, you do have legs. I went downstairs and laid a tray. I brought Dave's last meal up that day. <laughs> I even brought an appetizer, grapefruit laced with fertilizer. <laughs> Sliced, thinly, chopped and barbecued, he flushed quite neatly down the loo. My third attempt at witty bliss began so well. We loved to kiss and cuddle, cuddle at all times of day and never let a sharp jaws get in our way. His name was Lee, a gorgeous man. But soon, I noticed he began to nag me to pick up my clothes where I had dropped them. Held his nose and told me, this house is disgusting, don't you ever do the dusting. I got a broom and hit him hard. He's buried up there in the yard. An optimist, I tried and tried again. I made a blushing bride, but number four is pushing daisies. Gardening? The man was crazy. And when it came to number five, his weakness showed up on a drive. When I went through red traffic lights, he rudely said, that wasn't right. While he checked underneath the bonnet, I found the accelerator, stepped on it, and drove him into paradise. I know, I know, it wasn't nice. So now, I'm in an awful fix. I need to find mate number six. I think perhaps a poet will be what I need. <laughs> or would I kill a man who sings and rhymes to me? But one proviso, he must be my greatest fan. I love your stuff. <laughs> or would I kill a man who for would I kill a man who sings and rhymes to me? But one proviso, he must be my greatest fan, for he must see he must not criticize my writing or my sharp pen between him, his eyes will send him up to husband heaven. And then I'll have to look for number seven. Another sad story. Uh, I have known some very nice men, but some of them um, really do overstep the mark. And this is the sad story of Michael. Michael was an awful flirt. His charm was legendary. It hurt his steady girlfriend when she saw the way he always hoped to score. One day, one night, as Mike was chatting up a girl called Anna, whose bra, bra cup was 32, but <coughs> double D, his girlfriend told him, don't you see, if you go on, my plan is this, 
I'll have to shoot you. I won't miss. Well, Michael said, you won't, you know. You really love me, don't you know? And carried on to flirt some more. His girlfriend, feeling very sore, like Cupid, took a bow and arrow. Aimed, shot, and his escape was narrow. Her shot did not go through his heart, but rather lower. It did smart. And Michael's, and now his voice is quite high pitched. His girl's now seeing Anna. Bitch, said Michael, how was I to know that both the girls were by? And the moral of that is, a bitch in the hand is worth two birds in each other's bushes. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John Wendell.